So before we really dive into this lab, let's look at our streak plate from last week and do we have isolated colonies. And I think um, most of you guys that were here, right, as I was handing them out, we pretty much determined that I think just about everybody for the most part has at least one isolated colony, right? One colony that's all by itself and not touching others. So um, after 24 hours at 37 degrees Celsius, how many cells would you think would be in a colony if it was started from a single cell? What do you think? Ballpark. 100, 1,000, million, billion. What do you think? Which one? A million, a billion? No, more like a billion is possible. Or a million, a couple million, a couple million cells, right? A lot of bacteria. And look at your plates again. That little circle of growth, right? And there's probably more there because those plates we did, what, two weeks ago? Granted, I took them out of the incubator and refrigerated them to slow their growth, uh, but there's still a lot of bacteria there. So in a liquid culture, which those are not, with aeration, right, if we had a shaking incubator or a rotating incubator that would add in oxygen, um, some bacteria, for instance, E. coli, for example, could copy itself every 20 minutes, right? So if you start out with one cell, 20 minutes later, you have how many? Two. And then you have four, right? It doubles. Eight. 16, 32, 64, that's about as high as I can go, that I have memorized, <laughs> right? So it's two to however many doublings are possible. So let's just round this up to say a half an hour, right? Because that's a nice, easy number, right, to be able to calculate. Uh, and, you know, considering we're on a nutrient agar plate instead of, you know, in a liquid broth with aeration and mixing around, right? So... Um, nutrients aren't going to be as readily available on a nutrient auger plate, and oxygen is also going to be an issue, too, because they literally will grow on top of each other, right? They're going to spread out, but they'll grow up as well. So after 24 hours, that would be 48 doublings, right? 48 times they doubled the number of bacteria that were present, right? So again, that would be an exponent, right? 2 to the 48th power. So just to do some quick math without having to plug it into a calculator, like we could, again, kind of round up to, say, about 50, right, to make it easier. We can split 50 into 5 and 10, right, and just take right here 2 to the 10th power, right, that's essentially about 1,000, right. Then we've got to times that by 5, right. So we substitute that in there, right, times that by 5. So we have 10 to the 3rd power, 1,000, times by 5, which is 10 to the 15th. Which, again, 15 zeros. Like, can you figure out what that is, right? That's a lot. So let's divide it up into segments that we're used to, right? So if we, to the 6th power is a million, is it not? Right? 6 zeros, right? Or even better, 9 zeros would be a billion. So... Just some very quick math. We're looking at a million times a billion potential bacteria there in 24 hours. It's pretty crazy. Actual math, 2.8 times 10 to the 14th. It's a really big number, right? I'm talking about a lot of bacteria here. Um, so our quick math is just off, uh, you know, by about 3.5, a factor of 3.5. It's not very far off. So how many are in actual colony, right? It depends on the species. So we used E. coli as an example, right? We know how quickly, under what conditions, relatively, it can double itself, what its generation time is. Mycobacteria leprae, for instance, takes an entire day, 24 hours, to double itself, right? So there can be a huge variation between uh, microorganisms. E. coli has got to be, I think, probably the fastest one out there. I don't know one any faster than that. 
Um, and, and the other end of the spectrum, Mycobacteria leprae, I have to say, is probably one of the slowest growers out there. But temperature, especially, right? The conditions in which we grow these organisms under, how much food they have, how much oxygen they have available, how much water, right? All these things that are necessary for growth will affect that generation time as well. How quickly can they double themselves? So some species can grow anaerobically, right? They don't need oxygen. Um, they actually can grow down into the auger. So they don't just stay on the surface. They can actually go into the auger itself. Some can grow both aerobically and anaerobically. E. coli is one of those, what we call a facultative anaerobe, right? It grows really good with oxygen, right? Um, not so good without it. It ferments instead. Uh, but it can still grow and still be alive, right? Better than dying, right, if you didn't have oxygen. Um, so it generates more energy when it's um, respiring aerobically with with oxygen. So again, think about that architecture of the organisms on that plate, right? Um, you know, there's going to be ones on top of each other, and um, there's going to be difficulty in access to nutrients. So the, um, the growth rate is going to be affected by that. Cells in the middle of the colony are, are no longer surrounded by nutrients. They're surrounded by, you know, their daughters, right? Um, they kind of pig pile in on top of each other. Um, therefore, doublings in a colony will not take place um, continuously as they would in a li liquid culture where they're being shaken up, right, because of the architecture of the situation. Um, and, and then also all the cultures that we're using is what's referred to as a closed system. So imagine we took our organisms and we stuck them in a fallout shelter with a whole bunch of MREs and the toilet just broke, right? That's the situation we put them in when we put them in these tubes, right? So over time, waste are going to build up. They have no way of removing them, right? Those can be toxic. They're waste for a reason. Um, they're going to run out of food. And they're going to run out of space, too, right? Space can be an issue when you're in a closed system. So um, it's a little bit less. It's less than this. Um, there is, has been a, a study done by researchers, although they didn't specify their conditions like temperature and they weren't very specific, um, but they figured out that there was about 3 billion um, cells per colony, 3.3 billion, right? So again, a lot of bacteria. So when I say today you only need a little bit, I'm not kidding. <laughs> you only need a little bit. So you'll notice, right? I cleaned and made new loops for you guys and needles. This is the way some of the loops looked, all corroded like this. That's because students pick up too much bacteria. And then when you flame it, you basically harden their ash and corrode our loops. Um, and then that makes it harder to actually pick up and get clean samples, right? Because then there's little grooves and stuff in this, in this loop, um, and you can't really get all the bacteria out. You can't necessarily get to all of them and kill them. Um, so we want to pick up small amounts. If you're, if you're one of those ones that has trouble with that, then maybe choose a needle instead where you can only get a tiny bit, right, at the tip of that needle. But that's all you need, right? Because think about it, y'all. One of those little circles on there has a billion, around a billion bacteria. You don't need that many, right, for what you're doing. You don't need the whole colony. You just need a sample from it. So if you're looking at that number, it suggests that the doubling time was actually around 45 minutes um, on average uh, for those cells. So could we experimentally determine this? Yeah, we could. Um, and in the past, we used to do an experiment um, where we try to figure out how many cells. And, and we're going to do a counting activity. But this semester, you guys get to be a little bit of a guinea pigs. We're going to do a plaque assay instead, um, a demonstration of a plaque assay. Uh, we're actually going to use viruses to kill bacteria and determine how many viruses we had in our sample by the number, um, by the number of plaques, areas of death that they cause um, to the bacteria. So pretty cool stuff. So 
Um, I'm going to skip over this slide, but yes, it could, it could, it can be done, right? You can enumerate, you can figure out. There's different ways and techniques of doing it. Um, I want to get some chambers. Um, biotech is going to get some in, uh, and I wanted to, but later on I'll show you guys a picture of special little chamber microscope slides that have a specific um, volume to them, and they have little etched um, um, grid in the in the slide itself and when you put the cover slip on and you add it's a fixed volume so you know how much is in there and then under the microscope with the aid of the grid you can count how many cells are there well as you can imagine if you picked up a whole colony would you be able to count all of those microscopically no you would have to do what we call dilutions right where you would dilute right you would know how much you diluted it by and then you would be able to mathematically calculate. And we will do calculations and stuff like that um, later on after midterm, right, where you could uh, figure out. So I'm going to breeze over this one, but you can read it. It's kind of a prelude to some of the stuff that uh, we'll talk about later. But it can be done. So today is lab four, where we're actually going to put the bacteria on slides, stain them, so that we can visualize their structure under the microscope, right? So what shape are they, right? You guys, for homework, defined all the different shapes and arrangements where they stay grouped together. There's two basics, two, I say basic, <laughs> two common techniques for staining that are very simplistic. They use just a single stain, and those are the ones that we're going to be doing today. So we're going to do simple stains, which typically are using a type of dye that's referred to chemically as a basic dye. Okay. And then negative staining um, uses acidic dyes. And that's important because it's going to stain different things, right? Um, so some terms, and I'm not going to go over all of these, right, but just kind of as a glossary for you guys. Because remember, I'll make this PowerPoint and recording available to you. There's some terminology that they really go into, um, quite a bit of detail in your lab manual. Uh, chromophore versus an oxychrome. Peter and I both feel the same way about this, and Andrew will probably get on board too. It's not impor it is important to understand all these different components of the dyes, but really to understand that these dyes are charged molecules, right? And that's how they interact differently with the cells and allow us to visualize the organisms under the microscope. So structurally, this is what the dye crystal violet looks like, and this is what malachite green looks like. They're not very different, huh? But two very different colors. And the difference is just one chemical group right there. That's it. So this one is violet, purplish color, and this one is green. Resonance um, is a chemistry term, right? So don't freak out, right? It's not a big deal. Um, it's just referring to how the electrons interact with these molecules, right? Because remember, think about when we think about molecules, we're thinking about made up of several elements, atoms, right, interacting with each other. So... Um, the way those electrons move, and if you look at the structure of these molecules, they account for why they have the color associated with them that they do. Most of your coloremic um, molecules have these cyclic rings that you see here, right, where carbons are forming ring structures. Peter likes to really get into the chemistry of it. Me, not so much. But I still am fascinated by it. It's pretty cool stuff. Yeah, he gets into, like, the whole organic. He's a biochemist. So, you know, he loves this stuff. Uh, so, wants to know right down to the atomic level how and why, right? Uh, for this class, not necessarily necessary. Uh, but if you're interested in this kind of stuff, I can try and help explain it to you. Uh, so... It, they're absorbing light and, re, and, re, and refracting it on the other side of the spectrum. So that's why this guy is green. And this guy, because of the structural difference, it's going to absorb at this 
this site, but then it's going to refract the light as being purple. So, um, and again, it has to do with the structure of these <laughs> molecules. The important thing for us for this class is both of these guys are what we call basic dyes. They're commonly used in what we call a simple stain procedure, where you just want use a single dye. Um, and it's also the primary stain, the first stain we use in the Gram stain procedure, which you guys are going to do next week. And those of you guys in lecture should already know this stuff, right? Gram stain? You're good? Or you're going to be by the end of the semester, right? Um, malachite green is another basic dye, um, and it's used to detect endospores. We'll use it to actually stain endospores um, in lab six. These guys will crystallize with um, chlorine ions, so hence the chlorine over here, in um, solid form. We usually add them to an aqueous solution to water, right, maybe even ethanol to help dissolve them. Um, so just like salt, right, sodium and chloride, they separate from each other. So in solution that happens, and so the dye itself becomes positively charged, and then you have the chlorine ions, which are negatively charged. This is what's important, is that these guys take on a positive charge, right? They give up their electrons. They let chlorine run off with them. They're like, okay, I'm, I'm not really all that attached to them. You can have them, right? So they become positively charged. Both of these guys do that. So positively charged, positively charged. So... Microscopy accomplishes three important things for us um, compared to just being able to see something with our naked eyes, right? One of the first things is it helps improve resolution, right? Help us be able to see the images clearly. And we can even mathematically calculate that. Remember back to lab one? I know it seems like forever ago, especially with our Mardi Gras break, right? Uh, but you do need to know this, right? It's the effect of the lens is to control the wavelengths entering and exiting the specimen to produce a uh, real image. And then, of course, we see the virtual image as we look through the ocular. We can calculate this if we know the wavelength of light. We can divide that by the numerical aperture of our condenser, which, remember, of course, condenses the light onto the, onto the slide, and then the objective lens, which is going to focus the light so that we can um, see. And this is a distance, right? Nanometers, right? Tells us the minimum distance. The two objects need to be apart for you to see them as two separate. Otherwise, what's going to happen? If you have two things really close together, they're going to what? Do I need to pick on Ashante again? They're going to blur into one, right? You're not going to see them as being separate. So your resolutions are not going to be there. And then, of course, one of the main reasons we use a microscope is what? Magnification, right? And for our microscopes, there's just not one lens that magnifies the image. There are how many? Two, right? And so in order to figure out the total magnification of the specimen that we're looking at, we need to do what with the two um, magnifiers? How do we figure out total magnification? We multiply them, right? And what are the two lenses that are responsible for our magnification? What's the one you look through? What's the one you look through? Oculars. Okay. And then the one right by the specimen is objective. So objective times ocular, right, gives you your total magnification of the specimen. Yet again, another formula and calculation you need to know, right? Contrast. There are some microscopes that can create contrast, right? Help us see subtle differences between the organism um, and the background is probably our biggest problem when it comes to bacteria because they're translucent. They're going to blend right in with the background. Um, but with other organisms too, like our eukaryotic organisms we looked at under the microscope, all of those were stained, right? Those prepared slides were stained. And it helped us visualize stuff even inside of the cells. What can we see inside some of our eukaryotic cells that helped us know it was a eukaryotic cell that we were looking at? The nucleus, right? 
Um, and one of the main reasons why it stains so well has to do with what's inside that nucleus. What's inside that nucleus? DNA. So we're going to come back to that in a second. So light microscopes that utilize light, right? So we're still staying in the light. You have several choices. You have bright field microscopy, dark field, phase contrast, and fluorescence. Which one did we use in this lab? Bright field, right? We're a bright field. So the background is very bright, right? And your cells are translucent if you don't stain them. You're not going to see them under these conditions. It's going to be next to impossible. So we use stains to help provide contrast, right? We're going to stain them so that we can distinguish them from the background. Stains usually kill, right? But if visibility is required for observation of motility, then stains can't be used because what are they going to do to it? Kill it. Do you move when you're dead? Not really. You can for a little bit of time, right? some twitching, but not real movement, okay? So um, when we want to visualize them moving, we cannot stain them. Well, I just told you they're translucent. How are we going to see them? Huh? Yeah, we'd have to do some different type of microscopy, like dark field microscopy. One of the ways that we'll achieve that later on is we'll decrease the amount of light coming through the iris diaphragm through that condenser by closing down the iris diaphragm, which is a lot of times the problem, like that'll get, that'll get kind of moved on your microscopes when you're trying to do bright film microscopy. When you get to oil immersion, right, there's very little bit of light getting through as it is. You don't want to limit the amount of light. So if, if everything looks kind of dark, check out, remember, in your condenser apparatus underneath your stage, make sure your iris diaphragm is opened up. Right, make sure you've got enough light coming through or that you haven't turned down your intensity of your light too much. Um, unfortunately, in biology classes, you guys are taught to wrap your, mic your cords around the base of the microscope, but that's where the condenser is, right? Underneath the stage, when you do that, you whack those components and you, you can whack them out of alignment even, which is why we don't do that in this lab because for us, the condenser right, and that iris diaphragm, that apparatus is very important. We don't want it to get damaged. Uh, the good news is these older microscopes are pretty hardy, <laughs> um, but even still, um, we don't want to inflict any more damage than, than necessary. So um, stains are going to help us actually see the cells, the individual cells, right? We can get to that level of resolution with our microscopes if we go all the way to oil immersion with bacteria. So um, simple and negative staining we're going to do today, and they are just going to let us see the shape and arrangements if the cells stay next to each other after they divide. Later, we're going to do some more, more multi-step procedures that are going to tell us more information, more than just morphology and arrangement. So acid-fast staining and um, gram staining are going to help us uh, determine uh, the composition of the cell wall of those cells based on what color they stain in those procedures. Endospore and capsule staining are going to allow us to visualize those structures, endospores which are within the cell, and you'll get a glimpse at some of those today that we won't stain them, um, but you may see them uh, within the cells. One of the organisms we work with is a bacillus, uh, but these cultures are so old, especially for you guys, that we're mostly just going to have the spores by themselves. So you might see little tiny things that don't really stain, like the stain might stay around them. Those are the spores. But later on um, in lab six, we'll actually stain them so you can see them. And then um, capsules are, are outside of the cell, and we're, gonna, we're going to do a special stain next week to be able to visualize those. And those don't stain. Um, we actually have to stain the cell and the background in order to see them. So um, the last four stains I just spoke about are, are sometimes referred to as differential stains because they're going to help us differentiate different characteristics. Does it have an endospore? Does it not? Is it gram positive? Is it gram negative? Right? Is it purple? Is it pink?
So morphology, there's lots of terms for the actual structures of the cells. So remember that these are three-dimensional organisms, right? So I have some models over there, and I, I attached myself away from them. So that ball, right, you could throw it to someone else, see who's awake this morning. So that ball, what would we call that in scientific terms, right? It's a sphere, right? It's three-dimensional. It would be a coxus if we're talking about that single one. If we're talking about all of them in this picture, we use the term cox eye. So this is Latin. Right? Plural is with the ending of an I, and us is singular in terminology, which is kind of opposite than what we're used to, right? When we say I, we mean a single person ourselves, right? In this case, it's a plural designation, right, if it ends in I. So for the next one, it's showing an arrangement. So the individual cells are cocci, right? but they're stuck together in pairs. What's the term from your homework that is for this arrangement? This one's diplo. Is that it? Diplo coxus. If we're talking about just this one pair. If I'm talking about all the pairs in the picture, diplo cox I. Right? Do you guys want to play with the wiffle balls? Don't throw them. You can pass them around. All right, so there's our diplococci, or diplococcus, just one, right? Uh, no model for this one, right? But again, imagine two of those stuck together in a, in a square, okay? So this would be tetrad, or tetrads, if we're talking about all of them. That's a very simple plural designation that we're used to. Now this one, right? There's a bunch of cocci in a chain, and this would be strepto is, is for the chain. And so, of course, they're cocci, so it's streptococcus. Or if we had several chains, streptococci, right? But in this picture, we just have one chain. We just have one chain. I guess Peter ran out of wiffle balls. I don't know. I wish he would have done this next one. This next one is a packet of eight cells forming this cube. Do you see that? So it's a three-dimensional, again, think of a three-dimensional. This is Sarcinia. And then the next one is a cluster. Because we're dealing with a sphere, when these guys divide in three-dimensional space, they have lots of different planes within the three-dimensional space to choose from. When they're staying together in those, those pairs or chains, they're staying along that same plane in three-dimensional space. That's why they're lining up, right? Where here they're going next to and perpendicular to each other. But here it's random. So imagine a grape-like cluster, right? A cluster of grapes. What's the term for this one? This one's staphylococcus. And a lot of times students get, and even I, mix up strepto and staphylo, right? Buy a little story to help keep you straight. Strepto, caucus priogens, causes strep throat, right? That's why we call it strep throat. It's caused by the organism streptococcus priogens, right? So I always think about how sore your throat is, right? <laughs> you definitely don't want to swallow anything. Your throat is almost like a tube, right? And you can think of that chain, right? Think about how you would not want to swallow a chain when your throat is that sore, right? So when you think of 
you think of strep throat, you think of a chain, you think of the tube of your throat and how you would not want to swallow that. Right? Whereas staph flow, on the other hand, is a clustering. So, you ever hear of staph infections? Okay? Again, they're just abbreviating the name of the most common offender for that type of infection. In that case, it's Staphylococcus aureus, pathogenic strains that can infect your skin, right, through a small abrasion and cause a pretty serious infection. What's MRSA stand for? What's MRSA stand for? Methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. So the scary thing out there is there are some strains of Staphylococcus aureus that are resistant to penicillin like drugs. Mycticillin is a penicillin derivative, right? Um, and so that antibiotic doesn't work. So then they switch to another antibiotic. It starts with a V. Anyone know the name of it? Vancomycin. So guess what we have now? VRSA. Vancomycin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. Will this continue? Yeah. Organisms are constantly changing, right? Uh, we may potentially run out of drugs. That's the scary thing, right? Um, hopefully not in our lifetimes, right? Or we figure something else out to kill them, right? Uh, but, you know, they're constantly changing and evolving, and, and resistance happens. So for our next one, what's the term for this shape? This would be bacillus, right? So rod-shaped, right? And these could be different lengths. So notice lots of different models here, right? And different diameters. Because bacillus, or bacilli, if we're talking about all of them, is also a genus name, a lot of scientists just say rod-shaped. So there's no confusion there, right? We don't actually use the proper term, right? Because the term is also a genus name, so sometimes it gets confusing, right? So a lot of times you'll hear us just say rod-shaped. Make sense? All right. So rods in pairs, what's the prefix for pairs? Diplo, and the term for a rod? So these are diplobacillus, or diplobacilli, if we're talking about all of them. And then a chain would be, what's the prefix for a chain? Strepto, so this is a chain of rods, and the, the term for rods, streptobacillus. Now this next one isn't the best picture, um, but I can't complain when I steal pictures from the internet. <laughs> I like this one, though, because I have just about everything on it. These are rods with a little bit of a curve to them. What's the term for that? Vibrio. And in this picture, they're showing that it has flagella, one little flagella. And this is very common um, for this shape of organism to have a, fl a flagella. And this is another one where um, it's a genus name. Vibrio cholera, right, the causative agent of cholera, is um, this has this shape, this vibrio shape. This next one would be a much longer rod with more than one curve to it. So this would be spirillium or spirillia if you're talking about more than one. And what do you again see in this picture? What are those lines designating? Those are multiple flagella, actually at both ends. And we'll go over that terminology after midterm for this course. And then this is actually all one organism, but as you can see, they don't have a consistent shape. This one even looks kind of teardrop. They mostly look rod-shaped, right? But not holding a specific shape in specific size is referred to as what? Being pleomorphic or, being, or, or the condition of pleomorphism. Pleo meaning many, morphic referring to shape. And there's a whole genus of bacteria, mycoplasma, that do not have a cell wall and do not hold, therefore, a consistent shape. Mycoplasma pneumoniae causes a, a milder form of pneumonia, commonly referred to as walking pneumonia. So then our last shape, 
is our spiro keats or spiro cat. Let me see your sheet. Can you see your sheet? On our terms. Oh, one singular and one plural, right? Spirilia is the plural term. Spirillium is singular for the this the previous shape for this one. Right? So spirillium is a single one. Spirillia is multiple, is the plural. Sorry, I couldn't figure out what you were saying. <laughs> Sometimes I need to see the words on the page. Thank you. Okay, so spirochetes, these guys three-dimensionally are different from spirillium. These are helical. Under the microscope, they're going to look more zigzag. Do you see how it looks like a zigzag here in here? Uh, but three-dimensionally, they're helical. And the reason for that is for the axle filaments, which are similar to flagella, but they run outside of the cell within an outer sheath. So notice within this sheath. So here's the cell proper, right? Here's the sheath, and each one of these dots, this is a cross-section, are the axle filaments. These actually contribute to this helical shape, right? Like a spiral staircase. And their ability to move. They can actually corkscrew through um, the environment. Did I give you guys the YouTube link to that? I'll look on, um, after I'll look and see if we have it. Uh, I know for lecture <laughs> class I definitely did. And so um, the sad news for this class um, and, of course, these are pathogenic, right? Um, they cause, some of the spirochetes out there cause things like syphilis and Lyme disease. <laughs> um, not easy to grow in the lab, and we definitely don't want to be working with this level of pathogens. Um, so we won't see any spirochetes under the microscope. So sorry. Um, in fact, all we will see are cocci and rots. That's as exciting as it gets. But, you know, with cocci and rods, right, especially with cocci, we can get a bunch of different arrangements. So today we're hoping we'll see some tetrads, right? Um, we'll see uh, staphylococcus. Uh, we might even uh, see chains of our rods, of our bacillus. So we always talk about bacteria being bad, right? But bacteria can be extremely good. And there's um, some uh, tribes in South America that they've done studies on that, you know, do things like this, roll around in the mud, unlike the rest of us in industrialized countries don't seem to do so much. We've al almost become too clean, right? We've sterilized our environment so much. We've limited our exposure so much to microorganisms that we have to take things like probiotics, right, to get microorganisms back reestablished our gut microbes, our happy microbes, for proper digestion and function, right? Um, they've found that because of their lifestyles being so different from ours and not as sterile as ours, that they have um, more diverse uh, microorganisms associated in their guts and in their bodies um, and have less health problems. Um, they actually harbor microorganisms that um, prevent them from getting um, kidney stones. So more and more research, you hear more and more about this, right? Good bacteria, probiotics. Um, and uh, I ate mud, mud pies when I was a kid. You know, I'm, I'm still alive. I even had jimmies on mine because you could eat ants where I was from. They weren't fire ants. <laughs> so um, it won't kill your kid to be a little dirty. Don't freak out. Although my kid freaks out on his own. I did not do that to him. I swear to God, I did not make him a clean freak. He came out that way. So, not really. Not really. <laughs> it's a, I don't know. It's a trade-off. So, examples of staphylococci, because most of you guys are nursing and allied health majors, right? We're going to be working with streptococcus um, uh, epididymis, and we'll use some staph, uh, coccus aureus, but non-pathogenic strain. 
Um, this one is, of course, named to the fact that it, it mainly is found on our skin, right? So this is a common flora that we're commonly exposed to, but can create problems under certain um, circumstances. So this is this is bonus information, right? This is not test or anything like that or quiz, right? Nothing for you to memorize, um, but interesting stuff. So I already talked about Streptococcus pyogens, right? Um, this I don't know anybody that suffers through this. Most of us go to the doctor's office um, and get tested for this. They can do a rapid test now. Um, using antibodies similar to a test that we're going to do at the very end of the semester. Um, but they'll still do a swab a lot of times and um, send it off to the lab and someone will still culture it. The problem with culturing, as we know, it takes time, right? And so it takes a while for the test result. Where rapid testing is going to give us um, potentially a positive result faster and get you on antibiotics faster. The bad news with this is some strains can produce toxins that can cause really bad side effects. Um, like scarlet fever and toxic shock. Um, so it's not really something you want to let go either. And it is a gram positive as we'll uh, talk about and look at next week. Um, so very um, inexpensive antibiotics, penicillin, amoxicillin, right? Uh, the good news is if you spill that liquid stuff, right, amoxicillin, uh, you can buy it real cheap <laughs> when the kid knocks it over. Uh, you can get another thing of it at the store. Even though your insurance will only give you one, right? It's not that expensive. Uh, so again, strepto, and then streptococcus pneumoniae, as you can imagine by its name, it's cocci that form change. And this can cause pretty serious form of pneumonia, but again, it can also get to other parts of the body, cause really serious um, conditions like meningitis. Um, so vibrios, I mentioned vibrio cholera, right? Um, can cause really um, bad diarrhea. Um, and there's been several outbreaks. Um, usually, again, not in industrialized countries like here. So we keep our waterways clean, right? And the foods that we get from those waterways, um, we help protect. Um, but it definitely can be bad news if not treated. A different Vibrio um, can infect um, waters and can be picked up by shellfish, particularly um, oysters. So there is always the potential risk, right? If, whenever you go out for raw oysters, most of the, um, I know at Acme, they have it literally like laminated on the tables, right? That you're at risk if you eat raw oysters, right? Of getting infection. <laughs> so, uh, but you know, again, the good news is that they do test for this. They test waters and stuff like that. But you know, they can't test everything and uh, ensure everything all the time. But they have really strict regulations when it comes to oysters, especially raw oysters. Yeah. They won't let you take raw oysters home. Yeah. 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 Young children, you don't want eating these types of things. You don't, mostly, that's mostly because you don't know if they have any allergies to it. Yeah. Uh, that's usually the issue with young children. Although, I don't, I don't know, babies in Louisiana eat things like crawfish. Uh, so, what we're going to do today is we're going to stain them. And so, there's two basic principles here. We're going to do simple staining and negative staining. So we're going to have two different possibilities. We're going to either stain the cells, or in this case, the background, right? So in the above pictures, um, the, st the cells have been stained with a basic dye. And remember, basic dyes have what charge? Positive charges. Our cells, including our cells, bacteria cells are negatively charged. So what do we know about opposites? They attract explains my first marriage, right? So the negative cell, right, attracts that positive dye, and it literally goes into the cell, right? Fills up the cell almost like a water balloon. So that's why in this picture, our cells are stained. So some basic dyes that we employ are things like crystal violet that we'll use today, methylene blue, and saffronin. Saffronin is a reddish dye but it will appear pink when we use it in the gram stain procedure. 
they are positively charged. So again, they're going to stain the cell instead of the background. They're attracted to that negative components in the cell, and it's a positively charged dot. In contrast, when we do what's called negative staining, we use acidic dyes. The acidic dyes that we're going to use today are Congo Red and Nigrazine. Nigrazine is going to give you this grayish background like you see in this picture. Eosin is another um, acidic dye. It's a reddish dye. Um, it's mentioned in your guys' homework. That's why I have it here. Um, but we don't utilize it in this lab. What charges do acidic dyes have? These guys are negatively charged. All right, so they're going to accept electrons because they're going to give away their protons. So why is the background stained? What do we know about like charges? They repel each other. You ever try and stick two magnets together the wrong way? And all they just do is keep flying apart, right? The reason for that is you've got the light poles pointing towards each other, right? And they repel each other. If you flip them around, then they stick. And that's actually because you have the opposite poles now interacting with each other, the positive and the negative. So like charges repel each other. So what makes a bacterial cell, or even our cells for that matter, negatively charged? What's this molecule? Nucleotides. It's made out of nucleotides with a sugar and a phosphate and a nitrogenous <coughs> base. A's and T's and G's and C's, adenine, guanine, cytosine, thymine. You can answer it, Andrew. DNA. Remember that? DNA? In biology class way back when? Okay. Nucleic acids, right? Deoxyribonucleic acid, RNA, right? Do we have a lot of DNA in our cells? Yeah, in our nucleus, it's chock full of DNA, right? Makes sense why the, why the nucleus stains so well? It's full of DNA. Look at the phosphate groups, right? These oxygens associated with it. They're very greedy when it comes to electrons. They become negatively charged. So you got a whole bunch of DNA, right? That positive dye goes running towards it. Okay? So that's why the nucleus stains really well in eukaryotic cells. That's why the inside of a bacteria cell stains really well, right? Because of the DNA. And then, right? So our DNA and our RNA. And then what? Do we have here, but yet another phosphate group? But in this case, attached to a molecule that's not charged, fat, fatty acids, that make up our membranes, right? Our phospholipids. So the membranes themselves, too, are negatively charged and are going to attract these positively charged dyes. Or in the case of our acidic dyes, which are negative, this is a lot of repulsion, right? Lots of negativity there pushing away that negatively charged acidic dye. So, what is the consequences of leaving a stain on a bacterial smear too long over staining? So, this is simple staining with a basic dye, right? So, it's positively charged. It's going to go into that cell, right? It's attracted to all that DNA and RNA in there. It'll appear larger, and if you stain even too long, it'll burst, right? So imagine filling up a water balloon. So typically in microbiology, if you're in doubt, <laughs> stick with the one-minute rule, right? If you're not sure how long you're supposed to stain something, try a minute. It's usually sufficient. It's usually not too long but long enough, because if we don't do it long enough, what's the problem? What if we do it for like 10 seconds? We're not going to get enough in there, right? We're not going to be able to visualize it. And what's the main reason why we stain? 
to create contrast to see it, right? So if we don't create enough contrast, it's going to be difficult to see them. So we looked at all these shapes, right? And these cells shapes exist in nature uh, for different reasons. And environments change, right? And different organisms are better suited to different environments. So these shapes come into play when we talk about that. And we talk about how much surface area they have in relationship to their volume, right? So if we had the same volume for a sphere, a cocci, versus a rod, a bacillus, because of their shape, we are actually going to have a different amount of surface area compared to that volume. Rods are always, for the most part, going to have much more surface area than a cocci. So mathematically here, right, 4 to 3, 4 is more, right? So a bacillus has a higher surface area to volume ratio. He has more surface area than a cocci of the same volume, right? The same amount of stuff. So why is that important? Big whoop to do. What happens across that membrane? Why does the surface area matter? Diffusion, right? Stuff goes in and out. Active diffusion, facilitated diffusion, food comes <laughs> in, waste goes out, kind of necessary for life. I don't know what you think. So if you have a huge surface area, and thank you Cox right now, because i got a good analogy for you guys, thanks to TV, right? Who's seen the Cox commercial where all the people want to run through the small door, right? So if you have one little tiny small door and you got all these people, right, or all this information on the information highway that wants to go through, it's going to get jammed up, right? But if you've got a big door, everybody's happy they're running through the big door, right? Think about this. If you have a huge surface area, you've got a lot of doors, right? Lots of stuff going in and out. No problem. This room, man, we're screwed, y'all. we got one little tiny door to get in and out of, right? So it's like that poor little cocci that's got less surface area, right? Not so much stuff going in and out. So that's really going to affect the growth rate, right, of an organism. If you don't have a lot of surface area, you don't have a lot of doors to run in and out of. Make sense? So who do you want to be, the rod or the cocci? Yeah, I'm voting for rod right now. Sounds best to me, right? Lots of surface area, lots of stuff going in and out. I'm going to grow really fast. So we could do all the math, right? Peter loves the math. I'm going to skip over the math. Because I start getting all jumbled up with equations. But it's all there. What's the take-home message here? Yeah. So the <laughs> diameter of a cylinder, right? It's 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 height uh, to diameter is approximately. This one is approximately the upper limit of reality for real bacteria, right? This particular um, ratio of of how, right? radius, diameter, this is the part we're talking about, to the, to the height, to the length. Make sense? Okay. So, this on the other hand would be more like a disc. Don't know any bacteria like this, right? But more like a disc like this, like this model. Um, our red blood cells are like this, but even more so they're concaved, right? They're biconcaved. So, what do you think about surface area when it comes to red blood cells? They got a lot of surface area, right? They're not this big plump round cell. Right? They're a disc and even kind of a squish disc. Because of that, lots of surface area, which is important because what's their job? Oxygen carrying oxygen gas exchange, right, carrying oxygen, 
to our vital organs from the lungs. Right? That stuff's going to diffuse into and attach to the hemoglobin right, to travel. Carbon dioxide is a whole nother beast, right? We won't even get into that. That's, that's A and P class, cross the hall. So now we're going to play with Play-Doh. So every table's got a little thing of Play-Doh to try and jive home this importance and see this relationship. So go ahead and take out the Play-Doh and give a piece to each one of your lab mates. Some of them are kind of drying up. i got to steal some more from my son. He doesn't need it. He has Legos right now, and they're cleaner than Play-Doh. This, this is a mommy issue when it comes to Play-Doh. This stuff gets onto everything. Okay, so now once you have your piece of Play-Doh, I want you to divide it into equal, two equal pieces. Make one of them into a ball, and this would be our what? This would be our cocci. And the other one is going to become our what? Our rod. So make you a sausage or a hottie dog. So they were equal volume, right? Equal amount of stuff. Who wins the surface area? <laughs> Our rod, right? We could wrap it up, right? And if you tried to wrap around then your rod, you would have not enough wrapping paper, right? Or if you wrapped your rod, you wouldn't have enough for, you would have too much for your, for your sphere, right? Because he's got less surface area. Okay, so now we could put them together into a rod. And we can do this, and it becomes what? This is Vibrio. And you got to keep going. All right? A couple of bends. What's this guy? Spirillium. This one's harder. You probably won't be able to do it. You don't have enough play to I didn't even get all mine out of that cup. He smashed it in. <laughs> it would be that. Spirillium. No. It's helical. Come on, y'all. I'm doing the best I can. Spirochete. Or spirochet. Okay, we're done with the Play-Doh. I know that was fun, huh? Please try and make sure that it gets sealed good because some of them are getting kind of dry. All right. So, which one of these meats is going to cook better or faster? This one? Right? Why? Greater surface area to volume ratio. See? Makes sense, right? Greater distribution of heat. So for these guys, it's definitely the little ones, right? What's going to take the longest? That good old meatball, right? We're going to have to simmer that one in the crock pot like all day. Same principle, right? The greater the surface area to the volume, the faster it's going to cook. So, right, if we were to graph it, again, poor little sphere is stuck. And this is why size-wise, y'all, these guys are going to appear really tiny under the microscope, and they're always going to be about the same size. Where rods can do what? They can be longer, right? So we're going to get different thicknesses, different widths, but when it gets when it comes to cocci, they're all these little tiny spheres, <laughs> all about the same size. Why? If they get bigger, they're not going to have enough surface area to support all that volume, right? 
because of their shape, because of that spherical shape. Where rods, right, are going to create more surface area to the volume inside. So, trees, right? Do they have to deal with surface area to volume problems? You betcha. And especially for their leaves, right? Because they got to do that whole gas exchange, light exchange thing we call photosynthesis, right? So, um, leaves, right? That's why they're broad like they are, right? Greatest surface area. Um, needles, right? Again, they're rod-like shaped, right? And again, a lot of surface area compared to volume for these guys. And these are, these are kind of like nature's little solar panels. Pretty amazing, um, believe it or not, at capturing light and generating energy. So if we consider that coxi and that rod, but now let's put environment into the factor. If it's a dry environment, what are you worried about? What are you worried about in a dry environment? You're, working, you're worried about moisture, right? The loss of moisture. So in this case, do you want a large surface area? No, because you don't want to lose water, right? Every organism, including ourselves, has to have water to survive. So in this case, if you're in a dry environment, who's better suited? It's going to be the cocci because of the less surface area to volume ratio. So it makes sense evolutionary-wise why cocci are still around, right? Otherwise, man, it didn't sound good for them, did it? All right? They seem like they were at a disadvantage having less surface area to volume ratio as compared to a rod. But if the environment is dry they're going to survive longer than a rod will because of their shape. Make sense? So rods are still around because you still run into dry environments. It is sometimes advantageous to be small. <coughs> but if you don't have a problem with moisture, right? If you're in a nice moist environment, who's going to win on the survival of the fittest of this one versus Rod versus cocci. Who's going to win, guys? The rod, right? Why? Greater surface area versus volume over the cocci. Bacillus rod. Yeah, potentially. But also different medications work in different ways. So the major difference when it comes to medications typically is the cell wall and cell <laughs> membranes, how they're organized. And we'll get into that next week when we talk about gram staining. So now with negative staining, why doesn't a negative stain colorize the cells? Why do we say? What, what type of dyes are we using for negative staining? We're using acidic. What charge do they have? Negative. What charge does a cell have? No. Nope. DNA, phospholipids, what charge? Negative, right? So what happens with our like charges? Negative cell, negative charge dye. They repel each other, right? So the cell doesn't get stained. The background does instead. So eosin, they tell you, is a red dye in your book. I added that it's an acidic dye. So what charge does it have? Negative. So what's it going to stain? Background. Methylene blue is a basic stain. So it has what charge? Positive. So what's it going to stain? The cell. So here, you're not going to get purple, y'all. This is not preschool purple, right? Red and blue mix make purple, but we're not going to necessarily get the mixing, although I don't honestly know for sure, and it would depend on the order, and this will make sense to you guys when we do um, capsule state 
next week uh, because we're going to use both. Um, we're going to use a negative staining procedure. We're going to use an acidic dye, Congo Red. We're going to stain the background, but then we're going to use a reagent that's going to stain the cells, um, so probably positively charged, uh, but then it also stains the background. Um, so it really would depend on what order you did this in as to um, what gets stained and whether you get this mixture. Um, but the important principle here for you guys with this question is to recognize that acidic stains have negative charges. They would stain backgrounds. Basic dyes have a positive charge. They will stain the cell. Right? So theoretically, we would have a red background and a blue cell. So if we, we don't have chromanometers in our microscopes, um, we're not going to measure, right? Um, but there is a difference if you were to measure the, the micrococcus luteus, which is a spherical cell, hence the name micrococcus, right? Tiny little cocci, right? Um, oops, I put the answer up. Uh, there is a procedural difference between how we set up slides for simple staining with basic dyes as opposed to negative staining with acidic dyes. That difference accounts for why the size for the exact same organism would be different. So what's the what is the procedural difference? What step do we do for making a bacterial smear, right? to do a simple stain versus a negative stain. What step do we do? So you had to write out a whole separate procedure before simple staining, right? What was it? I'm making a bacterial smear. What did you have to do to that bacterial smear before you had to heat fix it, right? What does heating do? It actually coagulates proteins and makes them sticky. So the fixing part is to literally stick them to the slide. It will also kill them, right? And that's one of the main reasons why we heat bacteria in our food is to kill them. But that's because you're going you're gonna to make their proteins useless. You're going to make them denatured, permanently deformed. So they're no longer usable. So the cell can't function anymore. But it, this also makes, as I said, proteins sticky. So you ever fry an egg back before we had non-stick frying pans? Remember those? Right? Way back when? What did you have to stick in the pan first? Some type of lubricant, oil, butter, something, right? Because if you didn't, what happened? It stuck. Because what did you do? You heated proteins. They become sticky. Really sticky. Right? There's a lot of protein in an egg. Okay. So what else happens to the shape of it? kind of shrinks up, right? Watch next time. It shrinks. Right? So, if we heat fix the cells, what are we going to do? We're going to shrink them. You do not heat fix for negative staining. You just air dry. So, they're going to appear bigger if you were to measure them because we do not heat them, therefore we do not shrink them. Make sense? So heat fixing is very important. We're going to air dry. That's why our light boxes have been on. They're nice and hot. They're going to speed up the air drying process before we heat fix. All right? You guys will get out your supplies after. All right? These are meant for heat fixing, not staining. These clothespins. Okay? <laughs> Although people have used them for staining. I don't suggest using them for staining. Right? Unless you're really good with tools, which I'm not so good with tools. Sometimes I'll grab this in not the right way and send the, the it flying. Also, if you leave this attached to your slide while you're blotting it, you will probably break your slide, right? And then guess what? You have to start all over again. Nobody likes starting all over again, right? So just use them for heat fixing. This creates a little bit more length between you and the Bunsen burner and the slide so you don't burn yourself. 
right? Um, I typically don't use this because I actually am pretty good when it comes to flame, right? But I would suggest that you do. And I will demonstrate using it today. Otherwise, it just takes too much time <laughs> for me. Um, so all your supplies are, are up front. I'm going to have you guys get supplies while I get my desktop ready. And then we're going to, I'm going to demo what you're going to do today before you start doing it. Let me actually unplug.